Nikki Stratinsky and I farm here in Crofton on Vancouver Island with my husband Nick Nicing. We started the farm in 2012. Yeah, since then we've also grown our family and we have two young daughters, Fanna and Odie, who are four and two. Yeah, so we grow on about three acres, uh, mixed vegetables, uh, certified organic. We came here after many years of working on other organic vegetable farms throughout BC, so that's really what our background and experience and training was in. Um, a shout out to all those old farmers who have mentored us over the years. Right, uh, so yeah, we describe our farming practice. I mean, the short answer is to say organic, but yeah, I do have like a background, a degree in agroecology from UBC. Yeah, I just really love that term, like the idea of like modeling an agricultural system on an ecosystem. But yeah, we still certified our farm as organic as well. So our, our nutrient management and, and including nitrogen on the farm, we soil test every two to three years depending on the area. So we have multiple soil types on the farm. So we'll do different soil tests for each of those areas. And then keeping in mind also the crop that we're gonna be growing in those areas. And then we do a pre-calculated application of the nutrients and we apply them just to the beds um, as opposed to like blanket applications across the field or the area. Yeah, nitrogen management is important because, well, first off, nitrogen is the most used nutrient by crops, so it's the one that's needed in the greatest quantities. And nitrogen is particularly tricky because it's fairly mobile in soil, and it has a lot of different forms it can take. So having it in the right form for the crop at the right time can sometimes be particularly difficult. Well, we wanna apply nitrogen in the right rate, uh, first so that the crop can take it up and make sure it has enough nitrogen available so that it achieves optimum growth and yield. Uh, but we don't want to over apply because during the winter months in the lower mainland and here on the island, uh, when we get a lot of precipitation, the form of nitrogen that plants can take up nitrate uh, can actually leach down to groundwater. And so in certain areas of the province, we've seen that this has been a problem. And so we wanna try and control the amount of nitrogen we're applying so there's as little left over at the end of the growing season as possible. And so with nitrogen management, we normally talk about the agronomic rate. So this is the rate at which the crop is not limited by the amount of nitrogen in the soil. And so we know that it is enough for the plant uh, so that growth is not impacted, but it's also not too much that we're not applying an excessive amount. And so with nitrogen, Nitrogen management, uh, we normally think about the four R's, so that's applying nitrogen at, using the right source, at the right time, using the right rate, and applying it in the right place. And so if we kind of follow those guidelines and apply it at an agronomic rate, we normally can get good growth and yield. Yeah, so what I like to think about is you know, maybe in a system such as this, we don't expect any nitrogen to be in the soil at the beginning of the year. Um, unlike the interior where if there's residual nitrate from the previous growing season, you know, maybe they don't get enough precipitation over the winter that it's, you know, leached through the profile. Um, so here, taking a soil sample for nitrogen at the beginning of the year, probably won't be the most effective thing. However, in an organic operation like this and in these soils, uh, they are probably getting a fair amount of nitrogen from mineralization of soil organic matter. So when they're thinking about the amount of nitrogen they want to apply, they want to kind of estimate how much that'll be. And then if they have a cover crop, they may want to estimate how much nitrogen is coming from a cover crop. And then, you know, trying to meet that agronomic rate, the next thing they would think about is nitrogen from, you know, their fertilizer sources. So something like feather mill or bone mill, um, they know how much nitrogen is in that. So if they apply at the right time, uh, these nutrients will become available to the plant and they can use that to meet their agronomic rate. And then at the very end of the year, we're going to take a post-harvest nitrate test. So how we developed this uh, practice of calculating our nutrients uh, really goes back to our first year when we started out. We got a soil test done just through a local egg supply place that sent it off for us, brought it back, and it included all these recommended pounds per acre. And we expect it to be low in nitrogen, which is very common in our region after a rainy winter. But we were also incredibly low in phosphorus, so low that the, the owner who's very 
seasoned <laughs> egg supply, said he'd never seen such low phosphorus. Yeah, and so it included all of these uh, recommendations about uh, quantities to apply and it would have added up to a lot of dollars in amendments and we were just starting out and only had so much to spend so we applied some portion of that and we also just blanket applied it across the area we were going to be growing in that year and then once we started growing that season things did not grow very well and so I actually went back to them and asked, like, you know, what could be going on? And he made the recommendation that we apply more, but that we apply it just to the beds. And it did seem to help. So from there, moving forward in the subsequent years, especially as we expanded into new areas on the farm, we took that approach. So we were applying very calculated amounts of nutrients to make sure we were meeting, especially that low phosphorus. And then as a way to save money and make sure that the the money we were putting on the field in the form of amendments was getting to the crops. We applied just to the beds. So the other option would have been to apply bone meal because that does include some phosphorus, but if we were to apply enough bone meal we to meet phosphorus, we would have been over applying nitrogen and probably potassium too for that matter. So we'll kind of be wasting money, uh, not to mention nutrients, and also bone meal of all the amendments we apply is the most expensive. So that's how we started out. We ended up creating kind of a, our own personal nutrient calculator <laughs> spreadsheet um, that you know, we can enter in, let's apply X amount of bone meal to meet even maybe not all our nitrogen, but a portion of, and then we can apply, if we do that, how much of the straight phosphate, like soft rock phosphate do we apply, and then potassium, if there's any of that's lacking. Yeah, so we use a combination of those. Yeah, so we use a range of products like I already mentioned, because if we were just to use one standard MPK product, it wouldn't meet our demands. Like it might meet the demands for one and be either short on another or over applying another. And so we use this combination of products to meet our specific demands based on the soil test. And then from that, I you know can calculate, I need for say a thousand square feet, I can, or an acre, I can say, you know, we need X many pounds of the bone meal, X pounds of the phosphorus, and X pounds of the potassium. I can actually, and then I have that narrowed down to a per bed basis. Well, our nitrogen sources, <laughs> our, our main nitrogen source is the bone meal. Initially, we were also using um, alfalfa to meet um, sort of a differ, like the nitrogen gap, I guess. Um, we've moved away from using alfalfa uh, in part um, related to organic matter, but also I've also talked to a few farmers who've had some diseases introduced with the alfalfa as well. Just the last maybe two, three years, we've switched to using a feather meal, which is like a pretty, I think it's straight nitrogen, just to make up whatever nitrogen gap we're not meeting with the bone meal. So we do also use compost. Um, initially, like we started buying in compost initially. Finding good organic manure sources on Vancouver Island is quite difficult to do. There are some good compost products made here, but they're quite expensive and also hard to get in like larger quantity. So we, we use compost in um, kind of a light application and we don't factor that into our nutrient calculation so we know and that's the other thing is we don't want to have to test that compost in addition to doing our soil tests and then also an understanding that that whatever that test shows might change over time so we really just are applying it as like a bit of maybe bonus nutrient and also um, mainly for the biological activity that we're assuming it contains. Yeah, and we didn't have a very good setup for making our own compost until a few years ago and now we are starting to like just from our own debris and waste, stir our own compost, and we've really just started to apply that a little bit. Okay, our cover cropping program, just basic, we know cover cropping's good, and we've tried to implement it wherever we can. The one use that we think about it is for winter protection, especially, again, because we don't have those, those snow covers, so we get a lot of rain over winter, so trying to both minimize leaching nutrients from the soil and also uh, compaction from the rains. So if we can, we'd like to get a cover crop established before sort of mid-October. Depending on when we can seed for that, um, we might just default to a winter rye. Lately we've been experimenting with oats, um, which sometimes winter kill, but we've heard they're they're less preferred by wireworm, which is another you know agricultural pest in our region. Yeah, and we really we are thinking about those cover crops not so much as adding nutrient in the spring, but 
potentially scavenging and holding any nutrients that are there. And then when we incorporate those crops in the spring, adding some organic matter as well. And then every year, like we'll have some portion of each of our fields in fallow and we will try to cover crop those with a little more intention for the whole season. Um, and that gives us opportunity to do a summer cover crop. And one thing we've been doing and had some success with, not every year, but enough that we keep trying, is doing a crop of buckwheat that we undersow with clover. And our thinking there was that the buckwheat being really quick, we're actually looking for something that might outcompete weeds um, and bring some weed problems under control. And then the clover can germinate under the buckwheat, it can grow in the shade, and then the buckwheat's very quick, so we mow that down. And the clover gets kind of mowed in the process, but then it seems to regenerate and come up quite thick sort of through this buckwheat mulch. Um, and then we have a clover cover crop established that will take us all the way through winter. Okay, so here we are in some uh, clover. This patch was originally buckwheat and that's what these stems are that you can see. And then we flail mowed it. The clover just grows through. So another uh, rationale that I didn't mention earlier is that it allows us to have a buckwheat summer crop but not have to till again and then reestablish a winter cover crop. So that's the other sort of low till thinking behind it. But you can see here on this side, the buckwheat mulch, like the, the flail mower, mower kind of creates a mulch. It's a bit thick, uh, but the, you can see there's still clover coming through. One thing that would help is if we could irrigate this a couple times, I think we'd get a bit more clover coming through, but we're confident that by mid-October, we should have a pretty good cover here. Yeah, among the many benefits of cover crops, um, one of them is, you know, they're available to either take nitrogen up from the soil or fix nitrogen. So here we have a cereal rye cover crop, um, which actually generally establishes itself pretty quickly. So if you're able to establish it, um, you know, late summer, early fall, uh, it will generally take up a fair amount of post-harvest nitrate. Um, and then when you, you know, come back the next year and are getting ready to plant, uh, you're going to kill that cereal rye cover crop somehow. You'll either, you know, do something like roller crimper or you're plowed in or you may even use herbicides. And it will release some of that nitrogen back to the soil, which will become a plant available form of nitrogen that, uh, you know, your summer crop can take up. But instead, if you have something like clover, uh, like we see right here, um, it will also take up nitrogen from the soil, but uh, being a legume, it can also fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. But you'll get the same benefits, you know, at the, the beginning of summer next year when you terminate that crop, it will supply nitrogen to that crop. So we won't say that 100% of the nitrogen in that crop will become available, but usually, you know, somewhere between 25 and 50% of it probably will. And so that can offset the amount of nitrogen fertilizer or supplemental nitrogen that you need to add for your summer crop. So the other method we use to protect the soil over winter is tarping. And we use that a lot because we're in a very mild region. We're able to have crops in the ground till quite late, but when they come out, it's too cool and often too wet to establish a cover crop for winter. And so we figure rather than just having bare soil there for winter, we'll put a tarp on it. So that's really when we first started using tarps. Um, and then we also found that sort of nice side benefit was in the spring when we pulled that tarp off, we had this lovely soil. We didn't have to wait for any cover crop to break down. It was pretty much ready to go. But then we participated in this tarping study. Yeah, I think an interesting finding of that was that there did seem like there was less leaching from soils under the tarp over winter so in addition to protecting the soil a bit was also decreasing the amount of nitrogen that leached away over winter. One of the things that's helpful for Vancouver Island farms is the soils of Vancouver Island were all mapped in the 70s and you can still look at those maps and we did for our property and it actually shows five different soil types all converging on this seven acre property. And it tells you the processes that form the soil, but also kind of what to expect, you know, in those conditions like clay or rocky or high organic matter. And as we've worked our soils and gotten to know them more, that, that map has actually proved to be really accurate. Like we can really see the transition between two different soil types and we understand the differences between them. Like we, because like literally they feel and look different. And so we test 
based on those different soil type areas. And then you can see those reflected here. Just This is a printout from 2020. So here you can just sort of see the different test results. From these tests, we will go to recommended pounds per acre, depending on a crop or just generally mixed vegetables. And then we use that to feed into our own spreadsheet that tells us how much of a specific amendment product to apply and I can show you that in a minute. So from the soil tests, um, so the first time we had soil tests done, they came back with recommended recommendations like X number of pounds nitrogen per acre x number of pounds phosphorus per acre um, but we went away from using that lab because it was a far away one in the states and now we use a local lab and we try to use the same lab every time we test now just showing totals they weren't including recommendations so we worked with a soil scientist to help get us to that point of interpreting this and telling us how many pounds we needed per acre and since then well we worked with the same soil scientist to help us do that calculation on our own in future so now we can take numbers from this and we've input them into our own spreadsheet and if you if you were to like do a close comparison this spreadsheet is essentially the same columns as what you see on the tests from the lab and at the top there is an ideal range which this range is what we've pulled from BC Ministry of Ag they have ideal ranges for various crops and then from there we can calculate the pounds per we've per thousand square feet. And now we're not relying on the soil scientist every year to do it for us. Um, but from, from figuring out that target, um, we feed that into the spreadsheet that we developed right at the start when we were having all these challenges with nutrients um, that allows us to enter sort of a suite of different amendments and figure out how much we need to apply on a bed per bed basis so that yeah what you know we have this like cheat sheet basically in our workshop so staff can like look at it and go oh I'm amending a bed in field three how many pounds of each thing do I need mix them together and apply them yeah and so the spreadsheet is set up you know each tab in this file represents um, a different field or soil type area so one test for an entire area of like fairly similar soil type and also potentially fairly similar crops will be growing there this year. So this is um, from field two. Here we have our sort of target nutrients or possible target nutrients. And here across each of these different colors represents a type of amendment. So we start out with our bone meal and, like, and then these yellow cells are the NPK of the product. And so if, because some years, year to year, the amendment, even if it's the same one, those numbers will change slightly. For a thousand square feet, this spreadsheet tells me I need 27 pounds of fish meal to meet my nitrogen needs. And I might just go ahead and apply that much, but like I said, if I do that, I might over apply phosphorus. So instead I'm gonna say, well, what happens if I apply nine pounds of fish meal? And then it tells me the amount still remaining that needs to be applied and met by something else. And there you can see alfalfa is still in the spreadsheet, but I have decided to apply zero. So I kind of keep moving. Uh, left to right. Here's where the feather meal shows up. So it's telling me now I still, if I'm going to meet that remaining 0.7 pounds per thousand square feet of nitrogen that's missing, I need to apply roughly six or seven pounds of the fish meal. And I kind of work across and then I end up still with some residual phosphorus and potassium needed and I meet those through applying potash and that guano. But um, these do feed into a pounds per bed for the field and that actually feeds into like a really quick sort of cheat sheet that I mentioned already that goes in our workshop. It also tells me like how much of a product I need to order for a year. But what I do like about it is that I can change the quantities of the amendment if it if the amendment changes or perhaps i try a new product and have it factor into how many pounds to apply um, and then at the very end of the year we're going to take a post-harvest nitrate test and so that really has two uses uh, one is environmental so it's measuring the amount of nitrate that is susceptible to leaching 
uh, during the dormant season. And then for our purposes, it has an agronomic use. So we can compare that post-harvest nitrate test, the amount of nitrate uh, that we've measured to the amount of nitrogen we've applied over the year. And we can think about that agronomic rate and determine you know, maybe if we applied a little bit too much or maybe we applied too little. And to do that, we're going to think about our yield as well. So if we have what we would consider high post-harvest nitrate as well as a good yield, uh, we could probably consider, you know, reducing the rate we're applying. However, if we have very little post-harvest nitrate and we didn't have a very good yield, it's very possible that our agronomic rate is actually higher than what we've been applying. So we may want to increase our rate. So a post-harvest nitrate test, really as soon as the crop comes off uh, at the very end of summer or beginning of early fall. We're doing this test because we want to know how much residual nitrate is left in the soil. So at this point in the year, having you know good soil moisture and you know a fairly warm temperature, all of the nitrogen in the soil that was going to become plant available has become plant available. So pretty much all the plant available nitrogen will be in the soil as nitrate. So that's why we're doing a post-harvest nitrate test and we're not looking for the amount of ammonium because it's all been converted into nitrate. But the reason we're doing this is to measure the amount of residual nitrate, like I said, and we can use this test as a report card to see how we've used nitrogen over the year. So we want to compare that uh, with the amount of nitrogen that we applied and then we can kind of determine you know if you're near your agronomic rates or if you were under it or even potentially above or way above it. So typically you want to do this after harvest like I said at the latest though you want to do it before 75 millimeters of cumulative precipitation in coarse soils starting on September 1st. In finer soils uh, we're going to do 125 millimeters of cumulative precipitation. For the area we're in here on the island that's generally somewhere around October 1st, October 15th, maybe even the beginning of November. So as we can see there are some cover crops here depending on when these were planted, you know, maybe they haven't taken up a ton of nitrogen. Generally, we do want to do this before we plant our cover crops. However, you know, sometimes things get in the way, but we still can get a fairly decent report card, even with these on the, on the ground. So generally we want to take our post-harvest nitrate test, you know, immediately after harvest of our summer crop. However, sometimes that's not always possible. Uh, we may still have crops in the soil, but at that time of the year, we should be able to take the sample and it should be fairly accurate because at that point, most crops are done taking up nitrogen. Again, if you have planted a cover crop, um, and if you're able to take the sample before it gets you know, very well established and is able to take up a significant amount of nitrogen, then your results should still be pretty accurate then too. Ideally, the, the best case scenario is you do it after crop harvest, but the important thing is to do it before nitrate is leached down through the soil profile. So generally try and get your sample taken, you know, for most areas is between October 1st and November 1st at the latest. So as far as materials goes, I always recommend a soil probe. One of the big benefits is you can do things very quickly. It's also a uniform size, uh, so you know you're always getting the same amount of soil, uh, you know, regardless of how far uh, down you go in the soil. If you don't have a probe, you can also use a shovel. You may not like doing a shovel as much just because it's a lot more time consuming and it's very hard to get a consistent sample. So you can always buy a soil probe or you know sometimes you can ask your regional agrologist if you can borrow theirs. You'll also want a bucket uh, because you're going to take several subsamples and so for every core you pull off the ground, you're going to put it in the bucket. And at the very end, you'll mix all of those samples together and take a subsample of that. And then you'll put it in a plastic baggie and you will send it off to the lab for analysis. So when you're taking these samples, the first thing you want to do is divide into sampling zones. So we want to group together areas that have the same soil type, the same crop, and the same management. In you know vegetable systems like this, where you have a bunch of different rows of different vegetables, we can actually group them together by their nutrient demand. So, you know, something like potatoes and maybe uh, a leafy green may need similar amounts of nitrogen. So we might group those crops together. So uh, right here we see we have an area of cereal rye and we know this was treated similarly. So we will probably take a sample and turn this into a sampling zone. Uh, and then over here, we still have some vegetables out. So we will probably treat that as a different sampling zone. Generally, you want to take about 15 to 30 samples throughout the sampling zone. Uh, and we're going to go to a depth of 30 centimeters, which is one foot. So I have determined that this cereal ryegrass cover crop is my 
uh, sampling zone. So what I'm going to do is try to get, you know, between 15 and 30 samples uh, throughout this area. So I'm really just going to take a zigzag pattern through here, taking samples until I get to the end. And if I need to take more, then I'll turn back around. So I'm currently going through the field and I am taking zero to 30 meter samples that we can get analyzed for post-harvest nitrate. I have a probe that has markings on it so I can see exactly when I hit 30 centimeters. And then once I take the sample, I'm just gonna to toss it in the bucket and then keep going. All right, now that we've taken our samples, the next step is to get it into the bag so we can send it off to the laboratory. Right here, I have all the soil I've collected. So the next thing I want to do is break this up as much as possible and then mix it up as much as I can because we're only going to send about a pound of this soil to the lab. And from there, they will probably take an even smaller sample from it. So we wanna make sure we mix it very, very well. So if you still see any cores left over, you wanna do your best to break those up because those are obviously soil that might not be analyzed if you send it to the lab like that. Um, so really, we've got about half our bag full. That should be plenty for the lab. They'll probably use, you know, maybe five to 10 grams of soil. So, you know, maybe not even a 10th of this soil they'll analyze. Um, so make sure you mix it very, very well. Mm -hmm. 